Welcome to the National Association of Realtors Center for Realtor Development Podcast, the show that brings you on-the-go learning for today's top real estate topics with your host, Monica Neubauer. To get more information about the courses and credentials discussed here, visit our site at www.onlinelearning.realtor and use the coupon code PODCAST, P-O-D-C-A-S-T, to obtain 15% off the price of any online class. And now on to the show. Hi, and welcome to the Center for Realtor Development podcast, the podcast all about real estate for realtors. I'm Monica Neubauer, your host. We are talking today about sustainability inside our homes and in the construction of our homes. This is an evolving topic in our industry and in our lives, and I am so glad to have an expert with us today to help us consider new ways to take care of the resources that we have and the opportunities that are out there in the industry, and even how we can tend to our own health and our finances in this journey. They're all related. Melissa Camp has been a realtor for 13 years, and she lives in Arizona, and she's been teaching on green-related topics for 10 years in her company, Elite Education. She is president of a nonprofit she started in 2016 called Sustainable Real Estate Education. Camp has served with NAR in many ways. On the NAR Green Resource Council, since she was awarded the Evergreen Award in 2011, on NAR's Sustainability Group Committee, and she has presented at NAR Annual for six years. The Center for Realtor Development, secret here, has some new online education coming up soon. Uh, They're going to release that in the fall, and Melissa is a part of it, so you will hear more from her coming up. Her other interests, motherhood, of course, and foremost, are working with the USGBC, helping with the green team at her children's school, and she has also served on the board of directors for the Arizona Association of Realtors. She is passionate about her topic, and I am thrilled to have her with us. Join me in welcoming Melissa Camp. Melissa Camp, welcome to the Center for Realtor Development podcast. Thank you, Monica. I appreciate you having me, and I'm looking forward to this opportunity to talk with you. Well, I'm looking forward to it too. Today, we're going to talk about some of the new things that are going on in going green. Melissa is passionate about this in so many areas of her life. So I'm really excited to hear what she's learning and even more importantly, what she's living. Change in this sector is happening so fast at the speed of light in our culture. And honestly, sometimes I feel like in my house, it's a little slow, although I did just buy a hybrid car. So, you know, I'm kind of, I'm getting on this and And my husband and I actually do a lot. So I look forward to you and I kind of dissecting some of the ways. I feel like we're growing and improving in ways that are subtle, that we might not even be recognizing what a good job we're doing, even while we're doing it, because it's becoming so normalized now. So we're going to recognize these growth areas that we're seeing in the movement, and it may or may not be in our houses. So we're going to talk about other things, not just in our houses, but kind of in the movement. And What do you think about this, Melissa? I think a lot of the options that are available are much more affordable now. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's so much easier to find um, sustainable products. They're out there. The big retailers have entire, you know, sections of their webpage just dedicated to, you know, sustainably sourced products or products that are made from recycled materials. Um, They're so much easier to find now more than ever. Right. I agree completely. So let's start. We're going to start talking about the home and then we're going to get into some of these other topics and items like Melissa just mentioned, and sustainable items. So, but let's get a little context here because Melissa has four children. So you're living with that in your mind. My children are grown. And I think some of that family perspective might play into how we talk about things. Yeah, a healthy home is really important, especially with my uh, troop of young children. Um, And now more than ever, now that we just are um, doing a pandemic for the last 18 months or however long it's been. Oh, right. And you're home all the time. Yep, absolutely. Home all the time. You're spending lots of time inside, uh, more so than outside. And, you know, as parents, we only get one chance to get it right. And with my kids learning at home for over a year, uh, actually just shy of a year, uh, excuse me, we decided to invest in our air quality. So some of the ways that we kept our air quality healthy is this is obvious, but to open your windows and use natural ventilation, uh, so long as your outside air is actually good quality. Um, we have in most two- places in America, it's pretty good. I mean, I think most of we can, most of us can do that. Sure. Sure. 
Um, actually, in Arizona, we have uh, the Department of uh, Environmental Quality has a website called Clean Air Make More, and we can actually download an app and you can see how clean the outdoor air is. So I don't know if they have that in other places, but there's ways to, to see if it is healthy for you before you open up those windows. Um, let's see, we're also doing um, really good filters. So filters are rated on a MERV rating that's spelled M-E-R-V in all caps. And if you buy a filter of 14 or higher, MERV 14 or higher, or a HEPA filter, um, those are really gonna clean um, small fine particulates out of the air, including uh, COVID-19. So I'll say that again, MERV 14 or higher filters, as well as um, HEPA air filters. We've got an air filter, um, next to each one of our beds and then one in our main living room. And that's really helped. Okay, hold on. Let me ask you, let me clarify something here. So the filters that you're talking about, okay, you have these, you have special filters and I've had those in my house too, like ozone filters and kind of things like that to clean my air as well, which by the way, if you're thinking of investing in one and you make smells in the kitchen, oh my gosh, they're amazing at getting the smells out of your kitchen. For our open floor plans, there's a really practical tip for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so you have the small filters. Did you add then, it sounds like you didn't add a whole house filtration. You're talking about your filters in your return air vents. So I'm actually talking about both. Um, and this information I'm providing, I took six hours um, of education with the Center for um, Green Schools, which is the U.S. Green Building Council. And so basically you want to do natural ventilation first. Then you wanna do your air filters, so like your returns. And then the last step would be the air cleaning. And then I, that's my little portable ones that I have next to you know, each one of the beds and in the, the living room. So it's basically a three-step process with natural ventilation being the first best step. Well, in the natural ventilation, I remember, uh, I don't teach the green designation anymore, but I took it and did teach it for a while. Um, I remember one of the cool things about, especially if you live in a newer house, my house was built in 2015. And before that, I had one that was built in 2006, which I don't know that there was a lot of changes between those, but they have a pretty tight envelope. Mm -hmm. And so the air, if you aren't going out of doors with some regularity, opening your doors, opening your windows, you are just recycling kind of the same air. And that's an important thing for the house to have some of that fresh air as well, because it's not coming in the cracks in the walls, <laughs> like your 1970s or 1920 house. <laughs> no, you're exactly right. That building envelope is so tight. It's really important to have some, some fresh air coming in, um, whether you're doing that mechanically or through natural ventilation. You know, while we're talking about the air quality and the envelope, the... The electric companies are are opening up a lot of great options now for people to get very affordable um, kind of home energy tests. Mm -hmm. Do you know, is there a better term for what they're calling them? Or the um, I would call it an energy audit is oh, what right. most That's of the evaluation. companies. Yeah, the mm -hmm. audit. Okay, good. Yeah, tell us a little bit more about what, what you're seeing in that. It's pretty exciting and pretty affordable. It is. Um, here in Arizona, it's been subsidized um, forever. Um, so you never pay the full retail value. In Arizona, it's um, at least in my area, because we have different utilities, it's only $99. But during the pandemic, one of the utilities also came out with a vertical, uh, virtual um, energy audit. So essentially, you're on Zoom, or you're on another two-way platform. I don't know exactly what they use. But um, you're walking around with an energy professional in your house and they're not even there with you, but they're consulting you and they're coaching you and they're visually looking at things that they can help you with from afar, which is very innovative. I've never seen anybody doing a virtual energy audit. Usually you have a, a provider come out, a BPI approved um, energy auditor, and they're going to do the blower door test and they're going to do the duct blaster test. So if you're virtually certifying, obviously you're not going to be able to do the, the measurement, uh, the scientific right. measurements that the professionals would, but it can at least give you something to start on. And that's, that's the biggest advice I would give to anybody is just start. You don't have to do it all right now. Just find some low hanging fruit. And before you put all that solar up on your house, right. let's make our home envelope real tight. And then you don't need so much solar or you don't need, you know, such a high tonnage on your HVAC if you seal up your ducts or, you know, do the weather stripping under your door so you don't see the light anymore. Right. I mean, gosh, let's try and make a quick list of some of just the, the cheap and easy things we know that people can do. You mentioned weather stripping mm -hmm. and... Sealing. You can get crazy with air sealing. I've had some real fun with a can of spray foam before, the expanding foam. It's like a $5 can and you can seal up, you know, different penetrations. Um, 
Well, that one's that one made me think about, oh, the other one you said was sealing up your ducks. How many times have we done an inspection in a house and the duct work has had, uh, you know, been disconnected from some of the hardware or from one of the things in the house? So, OK, so sealing up your duct work, doing the weather stripping and, yeah, using that foam stuff. But I was thinking, especially if you have an older house, so many of the windows, if you have any any cracks or any gaping places, that's a place where the air is coming and going. Um, so that you can use the foam stuff too. And honestly, fireplaces. Yeah, they definitely leak. Um, another easy fix that I did myself was um, installing um, insulated can lights that are LEDs throughout my oh, yeah. entire house. Um, and that was something, it just took me a couple of hours. I got a big pack of them and I went through the house and I was able to do it myself, which made a, a big difference. Um, I also just replaced a tankless water heater. I know that's kind of a big, big step, but it's definitely helped because I used to have to wait two minutes and 36 seconds for water in my master bedroom. And now I make, I wait six seconds. Okay. Do y'all love that? That she just said two minutes and 36 <laughs> seconds. And now I wait six seconds. <laughs> I know I'm a nerd. So I actually did <laughs> measure <true>. that. <laughs> well, I'm not, I'm not a nerd, but I love talking to nerds and you guys give the greatest detail. I love that. I love that. Well, and the tankless water heater is something to think about. It's not necessarily, you know, unless you're very passionate about it and those people have probably already done it, but for something to consider if you've not done it and when your water heater goes out, make some evaluation, maybe do some research in advance. Is that something you'd like to do in the future when it comes time? Because the costs are probably getting better. Was it, did you find that the cost was pretty reasonable or was it, did it give you a little pause? No, it was, it was absolutely great. It was less than I expected it to be. And I got um, a couple of different bids. Um, I ended up paying about 2,700 for my new tankless water heater. But then um, because my house is L shaped, it took a really long time to get down that water, that hot water all the way to my master suite. So we coupled that with a recirculation pump just under the master um, sink. And that was an additional $300. But for me to save two minutes and 30 seconds of wait time every single time somebody showers, it's been a huge water saver and energy saver too. Yeah. Imagine that. You don't turn on the shower and go walk around for two or three minutes while that shower <laughs> exactly. gets hot. You turn it on and you step in. What That's a novel right. idea. <laughs> That's right. Monica, if you want to get real green, I mean, we could even be showering with like buckets or something to catch all that water while it's warming up. Why couldn't you put a little bucket in your shower and then go dump it out on your tree outside when you're done? You know? That okay, that's <laughs> no, seriously, that especially for our folks who do live on the western side of the United States where water is sparse, sparser, that's a great idea. You know, if you need to let it run to let it get hot, put a bucket in there because you know, when there's a drought or something, you know, they have restrictions and things like that. They're not, they're telling you to take showers, but they're not telling you, you know, oh, get out. <laughs> that's a great idea, and it's really practical for those who care. Um, having these good practical ideas, we don't always think about them. So sometimes just having this conversation and people listening to it will give them good ideas to to make a change. Now, I mean, it rains here every third day, so I'm not putting a bucket in my shower at this point, but I'm going to remember that because if we get to a drought, boom, I'm doing that. <laughs> yeah. Even my friends in Colorado, this is going to make you laugh, but um, they would always, they conserve water in their bathroom by saying, if it's yellow, let it mellow. And if it's brown, flush it down. Yeah. You know, save a little water wherever you can. Save a little water, save a little money. They they do go together. You know, I mean, if you're saving, uh, you know, I mean, you're going to put a little bit more money in your tankless water heater, but I mean, replacing a water heater is getting, it's expensive. It's a thousand or $1,200 to do a regular one. And if you want a big one, it's even more. And that's the other thing. If you have had water where the hot water heater runs out because you have a large family, you know, and that may have mm -hmm. been something you encountered too, having um, a family of six. Well, the hot water, the tankless hot water heater does not run out of water, not run out of hot water because it makes it as it goes. All right. Well, cool. Let's, oh, let's talk for a second while we're in the house about plants. This is a cool thing in my house and I want to hear what you think about plants. And uh, yeah, I've got some cool things with this. <laughs> <laughs> what are your thoughts on have, do you have plants in your house? Um, I have about eight plants inside and I think I've got about 12 trees outside. So I'm, I'm big on, on plants, both inside and outside. We really need more of it. 
Well, they help your air quality. It goes back to the air quality. It gets more oxygen in your house and you're feeding the plants. And also my husband loves plants. So we have, you know, I don't know, a dozen large plants in the house. And again, because we don't have as many people running around, we can afford to have bigger plants, but they just, they make us happy. We love having the plants in the house. And um, I remember at the NAR annual conference one year, they had an exhibit like a globe and they had all these plants in it and you could go in and get an oxygen refresh. How cool is that? Isn't that a fun little thing? I might have to post that picture again. It's kind of cool. That's um, awesome. All right. Now, since you have your kids and you're trying to train them about these things, what are some of the fun things that your family does? And and I want to encourage our listeners, if you're working with clients who are conscientious and they're interested in things or they have children, this might make a fun little closing gift um, to explore some of the things going on in your area locally. So what do you enjoy doing with your family? Well, um, you know, I used to be a kindergarten teacher, so I love teaching kids. I taught kids before I taught adults, and our, our kids are watching us. They're depending on us. They're our future leaders, and uh, believe it or not, I have a six-year-old environmentalist. Um, I believe and, it. <laughs> I, I have a niece. I know. <laughs> <laughs> and my three-year-old could tell you what biodiversity means, so I, I've been educating, you know, my kids since they were little, and it's not, they don't even think it's just a part of uh, life for them. You know, they don't think of it as something separate. So um, to get involved at the schools, I head up the green team at the elementary school. And this year I made up a sustainability art contest for kindergarten through fourth graders. Um, we had about 50 different posters and it was really just eye-opening to see how much these small children already know and care. Um, their posters were really interesting. In fact, she who runs the art contest gets to keep all the posters. And if you come into my office, my whole back wall is all of these posters from the kid because kids, because it just inspires me. You know, the, the kids are my why. Why why do I care about all of this? Because I care about leaving the place better than I found it for the future generation. So it's just a good reminder. Um, and it was, I think it was good for all of the adults to see too. All of the parents got to see all of these posters and so that was one thing we did. Another thing um, my daughter Charlotte helped me do is we recycled about 50 pounds of crayons and the crayons that we collected um, were gonna be melted down, made into new crayons for children that were stuck in the hospital. Um, and then we also did a successful Hold on a second. shoe I drive. didn't even know we could recycle crayons. Yeah. You know, that'll be an interesting thing as you finish up this story. What are some of the odd things that maybe we can recycle that we hadn't thought about? So go ahead, what else, what was your next thing? Yeah, I want to say it was called the Crayon Initiative, if you want to look that up, was the name of the nonprofit that we shipped all of our crayons to. The next fundraiser we did was uh, called Got Sneakers, and we um, collected 120 pairs of uh, tennis shoes, which was like seven gigantic uh, garbage bags. And the sneakers um, were sent to a place where they could either be reused if they were in good condition, or if they were not in good condition, they would be broken down into raw materials and repurposed um, into new materials like rubber for playgrounds. Ah, that's cool. Kids definitely need to be involved in this movement. And we've had a really um, successful year, even during a pandemic, because usually we recycle in the cafeteria, like all kinds of like TerraCycle, we would recycle you know, plastic bags. And um, this year we weren't allowed in the school. So we had to get a little bit creative um, with how we were going to make an impact. Well, I think that that's just a cool reminder. One of the things, of course, with kids, you learn some of the new things and they're so connected with other families. And so I love the concept of the shoes and creating the playground basics. And, you know, my, my son, and he has started getting clothing from companies where they're making the clothing, they're so soft with recycled plastic bottles. They're doing so much in the garment industry now with recycled plastic bottles. I am just, I am beyond impressed. I have some experience in the garment industry and it needs, it needs some, um, it needs some, it's going through a sustainability revolution right now, but it needs some help. And I guess all I would say about clothing, since that's not really our topic, but um, clothing is one of the largest single categories in our landfill. So I'll just leave that right there and let y'all decide what to do, <laughs> but it's a big deal. Yeah, no, I think that's important. I just bought my um, son some sheets for his birthday and they were made from um, recycled content. And I believe uh, for one of the contests we did at the school, we also had an upcycling contest for the kids where they had to be creative with what they were going to upcycle. But one of the prizes we gave away was a backpack that was made entirely from uh, plastic water bottles, like you just said. 
So that stuff is out there. You just have to search for it. It's not that hard to find. Put it into Google. No, and it does sometimes cost a little bit more money, but also I think I'm interested to see with my son with these shirts, how long they last. If they're made from plastic bottles, I'm thinking he's going to get, you know, he's going to grow out of them before he, uh, you know, (laughs) hopefully he won't if he stays the same weight, he's grown. But um, if they're made out of that, are they going to last a really long time, which is another element of that, you know, kind of some things in there until they get out of style, right? (laughs) Yeah. Exactly. What is what is upcycling? So that's basically taking something um, and repurposing it into something else. The best way to be environmentally conscious is, first of all, don't buy the stuff in the first place if you're not going to use it. We can all have a zero waste home or a goal of a zero waste home. It just takes some creativity. One of the things I've been doing for about three years now is I refuse to buy the Ziploc plastic bags anymore. Um, instead, like I use... I reuse like my bread bag once more before I'll recycle it. Um, Or for example, I had a case of wine shipped and it came with um, like 12 holes for the wine bottles in this like, uh, it's like a, it looked like a recycled cardboard type of deal. But instead of throwing that out, I kept the packaging and I made it into a crayon storage um, center and I sorted all the crayons by color. So there's all kinds of stuff. I even have um, like an old crib. I use as like a towel rack now out by my pool. I repurpose like my old beach bags for groceries. Um, I mean, yeah, I even buy my clothes and handbags secondhand. And then, you know, when I'm done, you got to donate it. So I'm very careful with waste. There's also digital waste. I mean, I don't know how much people think about that. (laughs) Hold on. I want to talk about digital waste in a minute because that's a new concept to me. But let's just, before we go to digital waste, let's remind us. So uh, this was kind of, it's a good transition to talking about just minimizing stuff in our house. When I did a major go through of the stuff, I took, you know, some time off and I went through all my stuff. And that was when I had the aha um, to the concept now that when I go out, my husband even says this, he says, yeah, this is a Goodwill store waiting to happen. (laughs) <laughs> this store is a goodwill trip waiting to happen. So, you know, we buy minimum things and that kind of stuff, even though I love looking at the things and want to support them and occasionally do still, you know, buy them to support people in their businesses. But if you look at what you take and give away, half of it was stuff you either bought on sale or it was something you just threw in for, you know, your child. We buy a lot carelessly. And then two years later, we need to get rid of it so we can save money, time, and just space in our house and thus mental space even, which who doesn't need more mental space when you have to manage less stuff, it frees up space in your, in your head. So all of that is an interesting thing. And, um, you know, it's interesting you talking about kind of reusing. My husband is really good at that. He, he keeps up with these things. I participate in his plan, but I mean, we compost, (laughs) oh my gosh, the most amazing dirt. So we compost all our vegetables and we recycle everything that we can. And our city does have a recycling program. So now we have the two bins in the garage. We've got the recycle stuff and the garbage stuff and our garbage. I mean, between the two of us, usually like one bag a week. Awesome. By the time it's all recycled and composted, we, you know, not no waste, but I've been pretty you know, gosh. And then when we want to give it away, we give it away. So probably where we give it, some of it ends up in the trash after that. You know, I mean, I think there's a lot of people who don't want to throw away what they should throw away. And so they give it to a thrift store or something who then has to throw it away because it's not, it doesn't, it's not useful. So those poor people have to get it, get that in their, in their craw. I'm going to have to be the one to throw some of this stuff away. Um, which let me say that in an application to real estate and then, then we'll go to the digital. When I have a client who has a hard time throwing away stuff, and this is very true if you have a family member, because I'm, I find it difficult to take stuff away from my clients because I want their family to go through it or things like that. But if there comes a phase in there where they say, just take it, get rid of it, or find somebody to get rid of it, even better, because I don't, again, I don't want to take their stuff. When they're doing that, don't, don't talk about where it's going to end up. You know, maybe you have a friend who can do an estate sale for them, or they can donate it to somebody who can do an estate sale and make some money for themselves. But when your clients are willing to get rid of your of their stuff, take advantage of that openness to get it moved out somewhere. And the more sustainable or replaceable it is, probably the better your clients are going to feel about getting rid of it. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. All right. Digital waste. I mean, how many emails have you gotten with one or two words on it? 
or a thread that has like 30 replies. I don't think people realize that you have to use energy to send those little messages. They have to get from one place to another and that takes resources. So please don't send me any one word emails because <laughs> it's digital waste. <laughs> let me um, let me tell you something too. I was teaching, I don't know, a year or two ago in Nebraska and we were talking about in Omaha, they're like, yeah, Facebook has a data farm. Excuse me? What, what did you just say? Yeah, they only employ about 50 employees, but they got this data farm in this building that's gigantic. It's like an acre big. What's in that? Computers to store everything. I think of that sometimes when I have to send attachments over and over again. I'm like, oh my gosh, the same attachment is being stored in Dropbox. It's being stored in Google. It's being stored in Google three times. You know, and to be honest with you, I hadn't necessarily connected it with what you just said as far as it taking up the energy in the space in the cloud. But I did think about it as far as, okay, I'm paying Google for this much space to store my stuff. And if I keep sending the same attachments or the same photos over and over again, or I keep a bunch of junk photos that I don't like because, you know, we take six every time we want one, <laughs> right? You know, my so husband, again, he's good at deleting them. I'm not, I'm a little bit of a digital hoarder. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I've been thinking about this, so I'm glad you said it because, but then again, of course, I've been thinking of it in terms of money. Gosh, I'm going to have to up my iCloud. Or I'm going to have to up my um, Google space because I'm a digital hoarder. When in fact, if I could take one whole day and just go through some of that, delete some of the older stuff or remove all the attachments or whatever, you know, at least seven years ago, you know, if I'm worried about being sued or something, I can still go back beyond that and do something with things or archive it. So. Good point. It does take energy and it takes resources to build those buildings. Yeah, and I don't I just don't think people think about that day to day. We're just kind of in, you know, we're in survival mode. We're moving so fast to get things done and going in so many different directions that sometimes we don't think about our long term, you know, footprint. No, it's it's really good. I appreciate that a lot, actually. All right. Um, let's see. You love solar. <laughs> Let's talk about solar because I know you love solar. And there's actually a lot happening in the solar industry in a lot of ways. So tell me why you love solar, what you're doing or what, you know, give us a little green course knowledge here on the update on solar. Okay. Yeah, I definitely love solar. Um, it's We do live in Arizona though. So we want to acknowledge <laughs> that you should love solar. <laughs> yeah, you we have 300 days, 300 days of sun here at least. Um, but yeah, I just love it because it's renewable, it's clean energy, it can help us reduce our carbon footprint. Um, net zero homes or homes that produce as much or more energy as they use are here. I actually built a new home last year. Um, I don't live in it. I have a renter in there, but I put on um, seven kilowatts of hetero junction technology solar cells on the roof. And my tenant now has a negative electric bill. She actually doesn't use that much energy. So it's actually considered a net positive investment. So if you're thinking about getting solar, um, you might want to jump on that train before the tax incentives decline and expire. Um, I would advise anybody out there to purchase a system or finance it instead of leasing it. Okay, wait a minute. You got, hold on. You all, the, all these are little niche things that are important. Okay. So first tell a little bit more about what net positive power. Let's back up a little bit. Net positive power and how can that benefit somebody from having this energy created, flesh that out a little bit more. They're creating energy on their property. So I started with a really efficient home. So I built it from the ground up. It had a HERS rating of 52. So I didn't need that much solar to make it net zero. Um, but then we put on the solar and because the home envelope was so efficient and all the things in it were so efficient, we put the solar on and now I accidentally got my tenant's first electric bill and it was negative $25. So the utility company owed her money because she was producing more electricity from those solar panels than she was using running her refrigerator or her washer and dryer, or her air conditioning unit. Okay. So that $25 then, normally that would be credited to their bill. Are they going to hold it and credit it to a future bill potentially? Or does Do they give you cash when it gets too high? It just depends on how you set it up. You can um, have it accrued monthly or annually, um, however you want to square up. It's just up to the individual customer. Okay, so the solar is attached to the power grid and the, the town you live in is benefiting from it if you're not using it all. 
Exactly. So you've got the panels up on the roof. They're going to take into um, they're going to take that electricity coming in in DC power, which means it's only traveling in one direction. Then that power is going to go to what's called the inverter, um, or it could be micro inverters, but usually it's just one inverter. Um, and then that inverter changes the DC power into AC power. So the AC power is what we're using in all of our outlets inside our house, and the AC power is going in two directions. Um, and so then after it comes to our house, we're either going to use it or it's going to go back to our meter and it's going to go to our neighbor's house or whoever needs it at the utility company. Now, if you're off grid, you're going to store that in a battery and your extra electricity, instead of sending it back to the grid, you're going to save it for later or for at night when the sun is not shining. Cool. <laughs> Giant batteries in your house. Okay. Batteries are coming, Monica. That's, that's the way of the future right there is battery power. Well, and that's interesting. I mean, because I'm kind of, we'll get to the cars and talk about my little hybrid and what a fun adventure that's been for me. Um, okay, so you put solar panels on the roof, right? That was the form you chose. Yes. So my questions with that are, how much how much of the roof did that cover? Um, I want to say it's like maybe 15 or 20 panels. I can't remember. And then we put it on the west facing roof because in Arizona, the west is the best to take uh, advantage of the late afternoon sun. Okay. So, but you can also buy shingles that have solar, little tiny solar panels on it. Do you know how the pricing, I'm, I'm thinking it was less, more affordable to put the panels on than to do those fancy little shingles. Yeah. So the shingles are really pretty. They're aesthetically pleasing. Um, they're more conspicuous. However, they're way less efficient and we really don't know the degradation. I believe they're built with thin film technology, which uh, the thin film technology is planned to last between six and like 15 years. I, I mean, that's a really big time period. So I don't know how long those are going to last. And also if you're getting those panels, they're way less efficient than the monocrystalline panels that are on most of the roofs. And so you need a lot more. You need to cover the whole roof, right? Instead of just a section of the roof with panels, you need to put a lot more of those solar shingles because they're less efficient. Right. Okay. Now talk about something that's important. And that is what you were saying about purchasing or financing rather than leasing. Go ahead and talk about that for a second because that's that's huge and I see that on the forums in the conversation. So teach us and the agents about that. Yeah, I mean, I've been teaching about solar for almost a decade and um, honestly, solar leases make my phone ring all the time. Agents are always calling me with different issues related to solar leasing. So that is why if, if you have the capital um, to put up, uh, I would suggest purchasing them because you're going to have the highest um, savings if you purchase them outright. The next best option is to finance them, either partially finance them, or you could finance 100% of the cost. But when you finance those panels, they're considered third party owned, and you would still be able to um, recoup value if you were to have those panels appraised. Um, if you lease them, they're considered personal property. And when you sell your house, you either have to buy out the lease, you have to transfer the lease, um, or you have to remove the panels. Yeah. So it can get a little bit hairy. I mean, leasing is still a good option if you don't, if you don't qualify for the financing and you still want um, solar panels. But the thing that drives me up the wall, Monica, is people that prepay their entire lease. I just don't understand why you would prepay an entire 20 year lease all up front. Why wouldn't you just buy the panels, you know? Well, and it <laughs> might be a salesperson problem. I mean, if the company makes more money, they might be being taken advantage of or not presented with that option, right? That's true. And I helped write the um, solar lease and loan addendum in the state of Arizona. And we wrote, I'm sorry, we reviewed all kinds of different leases from different companies. And the scary thing about the leases is a lot of these languages, first of all, people don't read them. They're too long. They're cumbersome. They're written in legalese. So people just kind of sign it and move on. But you really need to read what you're signing because at the end of a lot of these lease agreements, it says, we reserve the right to modify the terms of this contract at any time. And that's really scary to a consumer that they can just up and change the terms of a lease. And I think that's why some people are hesitant to assume a lease that they didn't originate. Ah, that's a good point. If the lease is bad, they don't want to as assume something that they didn't originate with. I can see that being a real problem if the leases are that. Are the companies willing to sign the leases with new owners? Have you encountered that? Case by case basis. Some companies are really willing to work with people and other companies are, are not. So, 
Wow. Okay. If you bought the solar panels and then you sold your house in five years and you financed it, I guess you could also pay it off with proceeds at closing. Exactly. You know, and even the new owners could participate with that. Either they pay some of your closing costs, some of the things we're seeing in this in this market, they can contribute to that somehow um, as well if, it's, if they're going to be getting the future benefit. Absolutely. And if you are um, taking a listing with a solar home or if you're representing a buyer that has um, a solar home, make sure that you're using the green and energy efficient addendum. There is a that's an appraisal institute product and there's an entire page um, just on solar and that Monica has evolved over the years. I saw that go from something being very simple to something now being really extremely detailed. We'll come back to a couple of my other questions, but since you mentioned it, talk about the appraisal process because in Tennessee, we don't have a lot of solar. And of course we have such great water energy that we're actually, we have some of the best and most affordable energy in the country already and have that has been our situation. But I know in some areas, the people are putting in the green homes because their power is just expensive and things like that. So talk a little bit about the appraisal uh, for those who are in areas that, and they are seeing a little bit more of the client. I would think in the Northeast, some of this would be happening too. They're going to renovate homes. They've done a lot of work with new windows and insulation. So when people have done this work and put this money into it, and then the appraiser comes in and yeah, that house is, you know, 5% or 10% above the comps, not to mention this market, but you know, let's just set that off to a side. <laughs> uh, it's making it even more difficult, but talk about working with the appraisers and that document you mentioned and how can agents help the appraisal process for these homes that have had significant investment put into them and improvements that are very real and measurable. Awesome, awesome question. Um, so the appraisal process is um, really important um, to getting that value because if you are not a good communicator, the appraiser doesn't have x-ray vision, right? They need the tools to be successful from you. You need to tell them why this house is going to comp, you know, higher than another one. So to start the process off, and people sometimes try to start in the middle. You really need to start at the beginning. And the beginning starts with the lender, okay? The lender is the person that's in charge of the appraisal process. Whether you're buying a home or you're refinancing, that's who's in charge of it. They hire the appraisal management company. And so you need to tell the lender, hey, I have a solar home that we're gonna be um, evaluating. I need a competent, and I'm doing my finger quotes now. Right, yeah. <laughs> competent solar appraiser because appraisers um, need to be competent on in the assignments that they take, whether they're you know, competent in appraising a farm or a solar system or a LEED certified home. They need to have competency so they're not violating their own code of ethics, which is called USPAP. Yeah. And so the whole process starts by telling the lender, hey, lender, we have a special home here. Can you please send us a competent appraiser um, to evaluate this solar system? Here's the green and energy efficient addendum. Here's any of the other documentation, you know, to support adjustments that the appraiser might want to make. Can you please give this to the appraisal company? And so this changes hands a few times. And so it will go from lender to appraisal management company to the appraiser. And so I always tell agents the best practices, whether you're a listing agent or the buyer's agent, is to get that lockbox off the house. Make that appraiser um, call you to schedule an appointment. So when they call you, that way you can ask them, hey, have you ever heard of the green and energy efficient addendum? No? Okay. Um, do you have any experience appraising um, homes with solar? Oh, you have 20 years of experience? Great. Or, you know, if they say no, well, have you ever taken edu any educational coursework? So just like NAR has the green designation, there's a whole suite of classes for appraisers just on solar, um, on certified green homes. So you can ask them some of these qualifying questions to see if they're the right person for the job. And sometimes, Monica, they'll say, you know what, ma'am? I don't feel like I'm qualified for this job. You know, you're a little bit intense. I'm going to pass on this one. <laughs> you're a little bit intense. I think I'm going to trade out. <laughs> well, they're probably just saying that to Melissa Camp because I well, am a little well, intense. Right. Yeah, I, I never get that either. Um, no, but I mean, when you ask the questions, you made an important um, delineation there. When you start asking the questions, they may realize that they're not. And if the if you did get an improved price because of the improvements that were made, 
then you want to have that person because if you don't get that competent person, you're not going to get the price that your clients agreed upon that they saw the value in. Exactly. If they've never heard of the website pvvalue.com, you may not have the right appraiser. And so if you're getting some, some like red flags, that's when you want to go back to your, your lender and maybe voice your concern before the appraiser comes out. Because once the appraiser is out and that process is started, it's really challenging to challenge an appraisal. Um, because at the end of the day, it's an opinion and you can really only challenge it if there's errors or omissions. So you really need to provide this information up front. And that's why I really encourage the listing agents to collect this information early and often, be transparent with it, and you're going to have a way more successful transaction than you would if you're trying to capture all of this information at the 11th hour when you're already under contract and your closing date's coming up. Oh, totally right. I, I What I suggest to when I talk about this briefly in other classes and suggest to listing agents, you know, although it works for buyers in a different way, um, if you have a house that has solar on it or has geothermal or has been extensively renovated with good insulation and new windows and all these things. If you have a conscientious seller, then they can't wait to educate you about their house. Um, and hopefully they've kept all their receipts and their brochures and you need to get all of that at the beginning because those are sales tools. They need to go in the house as well to show buyers why this house is worth more and you need to keep the electric bills in there too to show the skeptical people that it's going to save them money. And so exactly what you just said, I just really want to affirm and reiterate what you said is that a listing agent needs to get that right up at the beginning. And right now with things happening so fast, get all that paperwork before you even list it. So you've got it for the buyers because um, they're going to need to be educated because their agents may not be sophisticated in this either. So educate everybody. Believe you're going to have to educate everybody. Absolutely. And it's another tool that if you roll into your listing appointment with the green and energy efficient appraisal addendum, and you can tell that seller that, hey, I know how to make your investment, your energy efficient assets or whatever they may be valuable when you sell your house. And I'm going to show you how to do it with this form. Guess who's going to get the listing over somebody who's never heard of that? Totally. 100%. And so I want to reference, if you're listening to this and you haven't listened to the appraisal episode with Candy Cook, we expand, you know, Candy. Yep. She's yeah, great. She's awesome. Um, we expand on what Melissa and I are talking about for the appraisal. So if you want to get the full appraisal information, go listen to that episode and insert what Melissa has been telling you about the green into that process. And excellent. All right. So, but back to the buying solo or buying solar, you said, get it before the tax credit runs out. What is the latest on the tax credit for green upgrades in the house? So I believe it's now at 24%. It was at 30% for many years. It was a federal um, tax cr uh, credit. You know, they're not actually going to like rebate you money. It's just less money that you have to pay um, every year. And it could be carried over. But um, in 20, I think it was 2019 or 2020, I can't remember which year, but it's, it's set to decrease by 3% for five years and then just go away. So right now it's at 24%. At the end of this year, it's going to go down another 3%. At the end of next year, it's going to go down another three. So if you want to take advantage of the, the most amount of money possible that you can um, receive back as a credit, I would get on, get on that before it expires because we don't know if it, they're going to extend it or not. Right. There's a good tip to share, especially if you live in an area like Arizona, Nevada, some of the really sunny areas. What a great tip. Let's discuss some um, regional concerns. And um, this kind of makes me smile. Uh, when people grow up and live in various areas around the country, there's different things in the green movement and in green housing and in energy efficiency that are different. And uh, I had a client ask me if he could grow crops in Tennessee. Well, what he really meant was, could he grow a garden? But because California is so regulated with their water, I guess you need to get permission for a garden, possibly. You know, and we travel around the West and in Arizona, it's notorious. We saw it in Colorado. A lot of people still watering their green yards. They want to have a nice green yard and green. That grass, it's barely, you know, even the grasses that we grow out here, that, oh, you need to have fescue or whatever. No, Bermuda grows best. You know, I am so much about what is natural to your area and when people grow up in different areas, they don't know what can be done and what's conservation here, you know, and I said, oh, yeah, you can have a garden and we only have water restrictions like 
twice ever. And all that means is you can't wash your car and you can't irrigate your grass. You can water your gardens, you can take a shower, everything. So everybody doesn't know. So when you talk about regional things like that, share some of the tips that you suggest with agents who are in different areas and some just some of the things you've learned about the different areas and, you know, fun facts like that. Well, yeah, water shortages are definitely a concern, especially when you live in a desert like Arizona. Um, we've got builders building like crazy here. And I honestly don't know if they're thinking about the water supply for all of the people moving here so quickly. Um, so that's, that's definitely a big concern. Um, in Colorado, I, I've heard that you're not allowed to collect rainwater, um, that you have to let everything go back down to the water table. That has been true, but the law has been changed a little bit. You can collect a little bit now. I mean, it's just been modified a little bit. Like you can get what comes on your own roof or whatever, but not, you can't go put something out like that. So yeah, but that was a law for a long time and it's just been a little bit modified. So yeah. Yeah, I mean, rather than regulation, I really encourage um, cities to to create more incentives. I mean, some of the incentives that we have in different cities in Arizona that I'm aware of are things like removing your turf grass, um, taking out pools and spas, uh, removing water softeners, installing uh, low flow faucets in your bathroom, your kitchen, as well as your shower head. Um, there's rebates and incentives for low flow toilets, quite a few toilet incentives, yeah. <laughs> um, smart, smart irrigation. So why do you need to water your grass when it's already rained? There's, you know, smart home features that can, you know, only water your grass when it needs it or your trees or whatever. How dry is the dirt? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. It can measure all of that for you. Um, so it takes the, the guesswork out of it. Um, you could also harvest your rainwater um, or even there's some rebates for uh, gray water systems, which I don't see a whole lot of, but I would love to see some more gray water reuse. Have you been connecting with any or very many folks on the East Coast or the Northeast? Do you know what some of their green issues are? And if you don't, that's okay. We can brainstorm a few too. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know a whole lot other than I believe there's a lot of radon there. So they might be doing some radon uh, mitigation in their places, but. We actually have a lot of radon here. It is an issue. You know, the odd thing with it, and this is Monica talking out loud. I, I do want to have my house tested, but I haven't, um, even though I encourage that for people to do that. But I don't hear of a lot of people dying from lung cancer, which is what they say radon gives you. So I'd like to do a little bit more study on that. And that's something to pay attention to. Um, but I think on the Eastern side of the country, we focus a little bit more. I mean, we're not windy like Kansas is windy. Oh my gosh. If they don't have wind, you know, those wind things, they need them in Kansas and Wyoming. They, the wind there blows all the time. But, um, you know, they talked about putting some wind out in the ocean because of course they're there. Mm -hmm. So wind and water are actually more, effective on the East Coast than solar because we just have more of it. And on the East Coast, we use with trees. You know, when you have the big trees, we have so many of the big trees. And if you have the trees, it just creates a cooler thing. Uh, I, I saw a funny little thing this morning, just a funny little video on, you know, watching some TikTok, something like that. You know, I was just spending some time entertaining myself. <laughs> <laughs> And this guy from Kentucky was in Florida and he was making fun of their thermostat because in Florida they had it at 76 and he was like, and I am melting, you know, I keep mine at 70 or 68, which of course during the day, I'm like, no, I can't keep mine at 68. I'm an iceberg or whatever. And the South is notorious, notorious for wearing your tank tops and your summer dresses. And then you go in a store or a restaurant and you're like, I always bring a sweater with me because it's freezing. Over air conditioned. <laughs> Over air conditioned. And that's totally a thing, you know, on the East Coast. But it was interesting in Florida how he encountered, they kept theirs a little bit higher, which I thought, well, gosh, they're really smart to do that because it, a little bit of difference makes a big difference to people. But everybody's different with their air conditioning. And I think being intentional with that. What? Tell us about the latest with the thermostats so we can help people moderate their electricity use in there. Because uh, the HVAC is a really big one. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I'm almost hesitant to say this because people always get up in arms when this comes up in the green designation course. There's some Department of Energy um, suggested thermostat settings. <laughs> um, I believe it is 76 during the day and 80 to 82 at night. As oh, far as the out. Department of Energy. Last time I checked. 
80 degrees now i'm not i'm going down at night <laughs> i do have a lighter blanket so i can be at 70 now i don't have to be at 68 in the summer but <laughs> i know we all have our, our threshold for temperature you know my poor brother he's he's awesome but he won't let his wife turn the temperature below a certain degree because he just doesn't want to pay for it oh well and that's a thing too you know sometimes it's the payment sometimes it's people needing to sleep you know get a good thermostat because yeah yeah, it helps you regulate it. All right. Um, let's talk briefly about the cars. You said you see an electric car in your future. And much to my surprise, I bought a hybrid recently and I love it. They're getting so affordable, aren't they? Yeah, they are. What kind did you buy? I bought a RAV4 hybrid. Nice. So I'm hoping it's going to last for a long time and it's red. And of course it's delightful. I had a RAV4 before, so I like that. <laughs> now, does she have a name? <laughs> yeah, well, I, I don't have a name, but I did put, I, now you asked me this, I did put something on my license plate. You know, my, my new branding is the Maverick Motivator. So I put Maverick on my little red hybrid <laughs> on the license plate. <laughs> the Maverick, I love Maverick. it. So yes, I think I'm going to call her the Maverick. There we go. Awesome. We've just named my car. <laughs> <laughs> or Mavs or Mavi, right? <laughs> yeah. So, but there's charging stations everywhere. I'm seeing so many of the Teslas, you know, the, their, the simple model is pretty affordable. And one of my agents was telling me, yeah, I'm, my Tesla drives itself i can answer texts when my tesla's driving what oh dear <laughs> oh dear it drives itself he said you have to keep your hand on the steering wheel every so often but it's literally a self-driving car yeah i mean i love the tesla i think they're beautiful um they're expensive and i have cheerios and goldfish falling out my doors when i open it so tesla you know at least the one that has enough seat belts for me i think it's the model x um that's just going to break my bank. I can't do a hundred grand when I have little kids and car seats and no, all that stuff. No. But I think that's what's been holding me back. Yeah. And it's not, that's where we have to, you know, those of us who are, who are attentive to it as you know, you're passionate about it, but it's like, nope, there's not a car for me yet, you know, and maybe there will be, but you have to balance what's, what you need, what you can afford, what's available and what's your lifestyle. Yep. Absolutely. I think I would have gotten an uh, electric car a long time ago if they had more models with a third row. Um, I'm just seeing some coming out this year. So I drive the Ford Explorer with an EcoBoost engine right now. It gets 23 to 28 miles per gallon. They just came out with a hybrid um, Ford um, that has like part battery, part gas, and it's one mile per gallon better on the city and the highway. Just one. Wow. Just one than what I'm already driving, and it costs twenty thousand dollars more. So, for me to get you know that hybrid, uh, I just I don't think it's worth twenty thousand dollars for one more mile efficient. So I'm really hoping that in the coming years, the car manufacturers are just going to put out some more options, especially for moms like me. If you go to the preschool or the elementary school, we have like a lineup of SUVs, you know, rolling in. So we really need some bigger, bigger cars to uh, transport our families. Well, the Toyota Highlander has a RAV, has a hybrid, and I don't know if it has the third seat or if they've had to put batteries back there or something. So I don't know what the, the latest is with that. Yeah, I like the the Highlander for sure. Um, I almost bought, um, what was it? The Chrysler Pacifica. That was a minivan and it's all electric. Um, I actually brought it home from the dealership to make sure it would fit in my garage and the garage would close because Monica, this is sad to admit it, but I've had an EV charger for two years and I don't have an EV yet. <laughs> Shame on me. Shame on me. I you are so one. ready. You got ahead of yourself. You invested in it, but it can't happen yet. <laughs> oh, man. Can't believe I just said that out loud. <laughs> well, you know, I just said my uh, my my license plate out loud. So there we go. We're both exposed. <laughs> my my license plate, by the way, is Eco Mom. That's how Eco I'm Mom. Around. That's awesome. That's <laughs> awesome. All right. Um, before we wrap up, because I want to give you the final word in just a minute, but are you seeing any any changes or adjustment in the construction industry that's helping, you know, with the throwaway, the trash, the waste? What are you seeing in the construction industry right now where they're working to help eliminate waste and inefficiency? Well, at least for the, the big builders, the production builders, those building codes and the energy codes keep moving the bar up. Um, so right now they're all building at a minimum energy star home um, and they just keep getting more efficient as they're learning. There's also like the custom builders. And I think that's where we're seeing more of um, 
some of the material savings where they will deconstruct a home that's existing before they um, before they demolish it. And so you can fill up, like when I've done remodels in the past, we'll fill up a, like a 19 foot truck with all the things that are still good. They're just not aesthetically popular anymore. Um, and we would donate them to a nonprofit. So I'm seeing some custom builders um, that are being conscientious about what they're doing with their waste and they're trying to be um, better. I'm also seeing an emphasis on healthy features. Um, I'm currently studying for the, the Well AP credential, and I think that it's really up and coming. What is the AP credential? So just like I'm a, I'm a lead AP homes, um, the Well is just a different rating system, and it's related to basically like involving nature uh, into buildings, um, like the design patterns, as well as like you said, that connection to nature where your plants make you feel happy. It's um, paying attention to the sound and the acoustics in the building. It's paying attention to the lighting and designing for circadian rhythms even. It's just taking green building science to the next level with a focus on health. Um, a lot of it can be commercial focused, but um, if you're interested, they have a checklist out there that you can immediately look at and implement You know this strategy or this strategy in your own home. You don't have to get the entire credential, but you're interest, if you're interested in wellness, which I think a lot of people are um, being turned on to. I think it's a, a really up and coming opportunity for us. And how would we Google for that checklist? I would just look at well certification. Well certification. It looks like wellcertified.com. Wellcertified.com. And you know, it's interesting what you're saying because there is so much attention on health. And if our personal health brings us back to getting our homes healthy, you know, it gets us right back to where we started with healthy air and the plants and the circadian rhythms. And even the, you know, my husband, again, I told you, he's the one who's really kind of focused on this in our home. He plays those certain even megahertz of the certain music. We find those channels on YouTube and play those to create good sounds in our house. This morning he had birds chirping. So... <laughs> That's awesome. That's yeah, great. it was great until one of them sounded like a woodpecker or something. I said, no, you got to go now. <laughs> <laughs> and we're done. <laughs> and we're done, exactly. <laughs> so, on that note, let me give you the final word, Melissa. Is there anything else you'd like to tell our listeners? I appreciate you being with us so much today. And I want to give you the final word as we close out here today. Sustainability and climate restoration are my life's work. If you haven't yet taken NAR's green designation coursework, then please take the time, fit it into your schedule because you will never do business the same again. It will enhance your knowledge and skills to best serve your clients. I personally consider green day one and two is like the core cur curriculum for realtors who are interested in building science and marketing those high performance homes. And last, I'll just leave you with this. This is not a drill. No one's coming to save us. Our future is 100% up to us taking action today. Each one of us can make sustainable lifestyle choices. You don't have to do it all at once. I'm not perfect. I don't expect anyone else to be, but we can all make small changes and educate ourselves and our kids. Yes, and improve our health and improve right. our bottom line. Whoop, whoop, whoop. Love it. <laughs> The sustainability revolution train. The sustainability through. revolution train. There you go. Thank you, Melissa. All right. Thank you, Monica. It's been a pleasure. That was so great to have a conversation with Melissa Camp. Thank you, Melissa, for joining me. Okay. Here's my question for you, the listeners, and even for myself. What is the point of application that you are going to take away from our discussion? What is one change that you're going to make from our conversation? What do you need to do in your own life? As you heard, my family is fairly attentive to these things at home. So in thinking about this before I recorded this, I decided that it was time for me to have my power company do a home energy audit for us because I believe there's things in my home that could be easily fixed or changed to improve our electric bill and our power usage even a little bit. So that's my next level. What's your next level? This journey, it's about making progress. It's about doing the next thing. You never arrive and you're never not there. It's just about learning and growing and taking your own journey with it. So what's good for me, for my family, my community? What's good for your family? What's good for your community? If you are a regular listener with us, I'm going to ask you today, please go to Apple Podcast and write us out a review to encourage others to join us. 
All right. Thank you so much for listening today. Don't forget to take some time to enjoy the summer as you go out there and sell some houses. Thanks for listening to the Center for Realtor Development podcast. If you like what you just heard, we hope you give us a positive rating on iTunes and pass along our podcast web address, crdpodcast.com, to your friends and colleagues. If you have any questions or suggestions for future show topics or ideas about how we can improve, we'd love to hear what you have to say. Just email us at crd at realtors.org. This show is sponsored by the Center for Realtor Development, an online learning platform owned and operated by the National Association of Realtors.